sorry. Okay, welcome those who couldn't make it today. You missed a really great introduction. I apologize. We're jumping right into it with the question of why you're here. So there's been a word bandied about a lot. Everyone's talking about wanting to be an ally. So I looked up the definition. I love the definition of words. So as a verb, an ally is someone is means to unite or to form a relation um, or to form a relation by similitude, resemblance, or friendship. So I just want you to ponder on the meanings of these words. Um, and I liked the... Sorry, I'm, getting, I'm forgetting something. There was part of the definition where it talked about a, um, a confederate. And I wanted you to understand what it means to be a confederate. So it says a confederate is one who is united with others in a league, mutual contract, or covenant. And the word league was most applicable to us right now because it says a league is an alliance or confederacy for mutual aid or defense. So it can either be offensive, defensive, or both. So when you're saying that you're an ally, this is what being an ally means. It means um, to unite in friendship and uh, you unite under a confederacy, which is a promise that you're making or being in league with someone, which means that you will fight for them. You will either be offensive and go out ahead of them or you will, def uh, or you will defend them. So be on the offense or on the defense um, and you could do both. So I think that's the, the thing that's the trickiest part right now is we're trying to figure out how best to do that. So the enemy, of course, is hate, which is a great dislike or aversion. But I think even more so the enemy is ignorance. And ignorance is a word that we throw about a lot, but I don't know that we 100% understand it. So if you are ignorant, it means you lack knowledge. So you are in want, absence, or destitution of knowledge. It is a negative state of mind. It was not received facts. So the problem is, is the people that who don't want to receive the facts. So you guys aren't, aren't those people. Um, the facts that we're trying to inform people on are the facts about racism. So I looked it up, and surprisingly, the word racism as a term was not used until 1902. It did not exist before the 20, 20th century. So um, what, we're, what we're looking to better understand is the status quo. How do we deal with the status quo? How do we change it? The status quo is the existing state of affairs. And one of the ways we do that as we study history is we work really hard. This is one of the things I took away uh, from my time studying history in college and has always stuck with me, is that in order to study history, in order to fight things like racism, we have to study it and look at it through the eyes of the people that experienced it. So we're going to talk about a lot of things today, and you're going to say, wow, that's awful. And you say, why are we like that? And you can't say that. We weren't like that. Those people were like that, and they did it through the mind, the eyes that they saw the world. They did it through their own experience. And in order to change how we are today, it does not help for us to say, we've always been so terrible. Um, we've always lived our lives. We've always had experiences that shaped us. And so in order to change, today we have to live looking at our lives through our point of view right now. And we have to understand the point of view of the people that um, created some of the foundation that we're standing on. Okay. And you guys can text at any or type in the chat box at any time for any questions that you have. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of homework. It's optional, but if you're going to come back next week, I'd love for you to do it. So um, as we're going through, I want you to pick one thing that you hear that you think was interesting, something that you want to know more about, because I'm going to touch on lots of stuff. And take that one thing and vow to study it a little bit more in depth. And then go the extra step, which is then to teach what you learned to someone else. Because it is in teaching, that's the best way to retain knowledge, is to teach what you learn to somebody else. Okay, any thoughts or questions before I jump in to what I want to share with you guys today? I told you I was going to cover Reconstruction, and we're not even going to get through it, so we'll probably finish it next week. But, um... Let's get going. Okay, so I'm basically going to tell you a story. And I don't study history from the uh, names and dates perspective. I study history from understanding 
the events. So, once upon a time, we had a war. It's called the Civil War, and it was from 1860 to 1865. And uh, as the, the war was ended, and what happened afterwards was called Reconstruction. So if you've been familiar at all with um, a conquered countries, they, they have to have treaties, they have to have um, consequences implemented upon them. Things happen when you lose in war. So Reconstruction refers to the period immediately after the Civil War from 1865 to 1877. Um, there were several administrations. There was presidential administrations. There were um, congressional administrations. And there were political party administrations, all three who were trying to um, reconstruct the society in the former Confederate states. And the goals was to um, protect the rights of the newly freed African Americans and uh, to help them gain equal status through what they called progressive legislation. And um, we don't like, some of us don't like that word, right? But that's okay because it's, um, it means something really important at this time. It was um, things that had never been seen before. And they also wanted to help the South recover because there was lots of devastation. Um, so the, the bad thing about Reconstruction is that we consider it a failure, um, although its legacy uh, haunts us and has giant implications in our life today. So what they were trying to do was, was figure out two things. One was how can they continue the desire to implement natural law in the world, which is that all men are created equal whether you think that is because that's an inherent right by God or by nature or by reason, it was something that not everyone was experiencing. So reconstruction was about, was how do we go about making that happen? And then um, being able to do that was by enacting what we call positive law, which is um, writing new laws, statutory law, case law, coming up with new ways to deal with this new world. And so it was, it was super, super tricky, they thought. So um, there are a lot of people who reshape reconstruction. So the years are considered 1866 to, oh, I put 1876, but really it's 1877. I apologize for that. These are some names you might um, want to know more about. Andrew Johnson was the president. I mentioned Frederick Douglass earlier, Ulysses S. Grant, um, Oliver Howard, if you've ever studied um, the story of Chief, Chief Joseph um, as he led his people to try to escape the army and um, he was being chased by the one-armed General Howard. So this was after Reconstruction but um, Oliver Howard played a big role in it. Um, the legacy of Reconstruction are constitutional amendments, black serving in office, um, something called the Freedmen's Bureau. And the problems were that it ultimately failed and it was it reenacted slavery as a state state governed institution and also ushered in the era of Jim Crow. So all right, we're gonna clip that. So we're just gonna go through this timeline that I made. So um, on 1860 Lincoln was elected and within so November, so it was not even within a year. November, December, January, February, March. So within six months, the Civil War began. So Abraham Lincoln was, was elected as a Republican. And the Republican Party, we think of it, we have to reverse our thinking a little bit because it's a tad bit different than today. But the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln. It was the party of the um, of um, trying to help the African Americans, help the freed slaves. Um, and the Democrats, especially the Southern Democrats, were anti-freedom. Um, in 1863, a little bit after the war started, uh, Abraham Lincoln signed what was known as the Emancipation Proclamation. And we like to hold it up, you guys probably already know this, we like to hold it up as the example of how great Lincoln was because he freed the slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves in the slave states only and because they were separated from us at the time, the law didn't even apply. So it was in force after the Civil War was over and it made a huge deal, made a huge difference. But at the time, um, 
it didn't it didn't really free anyone and Abraham Lincoln um, was a great man and I think he is worth holding up as someone important but he did not think that freeing the slaves was the most important thing he felt that um, putting the Union back together was his call and he said if he could if he could heal the Union without freeing slavery he would without freeing the slaves he would and if he could do it with freeing the slaves he would so um, one of the first things that happened right after um, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and I think I put this in the wrong spot so forgive me again but um, in December 6 1865 the 13th amendment was ratified and it was known as the first of the reconstruction amendments and it abolished slavery in the United States so this was a really important point bef um, in reconstruction because the states had to ratify the 13th amendment the southern states before they could even be allowed to rejoin the Union so they all had to write new constitutions and they had to um, ratify as a whole state they had to ratify these amendments to the Constitution so this was a, an important one and um, so I'm going to come back to this it says the January 16th 1865 William T Sherman's field order number 15 I'll come back to that on March 3rd 1865 there was um, a bureau established it's called the Freedmen's Bureau the Freedmen's Bureau was established to help freed people achieve economic stability and secure political freedoms so the war is over in 1865 and what had happened was uh, now in the country there were four million freed slaves who didn't have anywhere to go they didn't have um, they couldn't read they didn't have jobs they didn't know how where to go or what to do um, and they were in the south which was very antagonistic towards them causing lots of troubles and so they needed help so the Freedmen's Bureau was established um, Lincoln established it before he died and it was to last a year and then um, after he died there was a huge fight between Congress and the presidency to keep the organization but I think that the Freedmen's Bureau is important for lots of reasons so let me tell you some of them here um, the official title is the Bureau of Refugees Freedmen and Abandoned Lands and it was run by the Department of War um, a quote I found was said the Bureau helped awaken Americans to the promise of freedom and for a time the Bureau's physical presence in the South made palpable to many citizens the abstract principles of equal access to the law and free labor so the goals and the accomplishments of the Freedmen's Bureau were uh, as follows so they wanted to acquire land for freed slaves and they had an idea that there was so much so much land that had been confiscated during the war or was abandoned that it made sense to give that land to um, freed slaves they wanted to help provide financial security and so the workers of the bureau the bureau helped with labor contracts and disputes they also wanted to help with lab um, with they wanted to build schools uh, building schools is very important and these are the names of four um, African American or there are four um, colleges that were created during the Freedmen's Bureau and they are um, traditionally black schools their colleges and they still are around today so Fisk Hampton Dillard and then Howard University and I talked to you earlier about General Oliver Howard he actually ran the Freedmen's Bureau and the college he founded Howard University um, the other goal of the Freedmen's Bureau was to allow freed people the opportunity to participate in the political process then they did practical things like providing food to the freedmen and poor whites as we you know kind of mentioned earlier the South was devastated they also wanted to provide housing um, medical assistance there were uh, people who had never seen a doctor in their life so 
And they did that, and they built hospitals. Um, they did. They provided legal assistance. So one of the really great things that they could do was legalize those marriages that had never been legalized so that families could be legitimate. And then um, they helped to locate relatives. As we know that if you, um, you could be sold away from your family, you could have escaped and gone to freedom. There could be many reasons why families would have been um, separated. And then they provided veterans aid for uh, African-American soldiers who had fought in the Civil War. So after when President Lincoln died, the new president was Andrew Johnson, and Andrew Johnson did not like the Freedmen's Bureau. He did not like anything that was created by Congress. His whole presidency was full of fighting with Congress. So um, this this organization amped up the contest between Johnson and the radical Republicans because after its first year of institution, um, they wanted to get rid of it and uh, Congress uh, passed an act that said, no, we were going to keep it around. Um, the Bureau itself was underfunded and understaffed. So at its peak, it only had 900 workers. And you can imagine, as you probably know, um, white people, especially that went to the South during the Civil Rights Movement to um, help with that movement, were at, put their own lives in danger. And it was the same for the Freedmen's Bureau workers. As they went to the different bureaus to work, they were um, not treated well. It's the first social work type agency in the country, and um, you might be um, happy about this, you might not, might not, because it set the stage actually for the New Deal programs of the 1930s and, and the welfare programs that we have today. One thing I wanted to point out to you though as a, let me see before I do that, go to my next slide and make sure. Okay, so these are just some pictures to um, underscore the work of the Freedmen's Bureau. So over here we have um, African Americans learning, going to school, learning to read and write. And then this picture I love so much at the bottom here of, of a couple being married. And then the top here you have an ad that's against the Freedmen's Bureau. So it is showing this lazy roust about here, an ex, a former slave doing nothing while the hard working southerners are over here trying to put back their country and um, so there's a lot of effort to discredit what the Freedmen's Bureau was doing. Um, but one of the legacies, an interesting legacy of the Freedmen's Bureau is genealogy. So um, they eventually were disbanded and they did not get to accomplish the things that they wanted to accomplish. But um, today, because of the work of the Freedmen's Bureau, they took such great records that um, African Americans who tried to research their family history before 1870 would always hit a brick wall because before 1870 their ancestors who were slaves and um, would show up as ticks or hash marks on paper because they weren't considered um, people. So um, they didn't have a name and the slave, mark, slave master would just have tick marks. But in, um, as of 2016, an organization called Family Search and the National Archives um, worked together to open up these records, these digital records, and they have been, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, it's called index, so we call it indexing, so that people have read them, the, the digital records, read them and typed them out and put them out so that people can actually search these records. So now there are the names of nearly 1.8 million men, women, and children that are now searchable online as a result of the work done by the um, Freedmen's Bureau. So I think that's a really great legacy. I think it speaks to the idea that we never know the difference that we make in the world. So um, let's move on here. All right, I'm moving on from Freedmen's Bureau. Questions, comments? Okay. Hopefully you guys are finding something you want to study because I'm giving you lots. All right, so 1865, the war ended in Appomattox, Virginia. Um, they said that, um, oh, it was Grant, I think. The Union soldier who ended showed up in his dirty, mud-stained clothes, and Robert E. Lee had gone home to change and come in his 
his best. Um, Robert E. Lee is a fascinating figure uh, as a general in the in the um, Confederate Army. He um, had attended uh, West Point. He was a decorated, um, well respected military officer, but he felt the call so strongly to go and um, to support his state because states' rights were so important that he became part of the Confederacy. So the war ended on April 9th, 1865, and if you notice, like six days later, um, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. He was killed at Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth. And what's even more interesting is within three hours, Andrew Johnson was sworn in to the only term that he ever served. He served three years and 323 days as president. So what what do you guys what's the um thing that everybody remembers? I always get it confused because I mix up Andrew Johnson and Andrew Jackson. What's the one thing you know about Andrew Johnson? You can read my mind. Type it in the chat box if you know what Andrew Johnson was known for. Anybody? He was a jerk, says Penny. <laughs> Um, he was very set in his ways. He was impeached. Yep, he's our first president to uh, to be impeached. So um, hopefully we all understand what that means. To be impeached means that you are accused of crimes. You can be accused, and then you go to trial. So um, Johnson was was impeached. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, he came from the state of Tennessee. And the one thing that you have to understand about Andrew Johnson, which again, if you don't study history through the eyes of those who lived it, we would find it very hard to understand the, how important states' rights were to these people. So all of you, some of you, I know my friend Christy over here lives in New Jersey. Um, I know Penny is in Utah. Um, a lot of us are here in Washington. So ask yourself the question, would you go to war in behalf of your state would you um fight in the you know federal government fight federally for laws that um are so important to your state it's a diff it's a really different way of thinking although i might say we should probably get back to it a little bit but that's another conversation um andrew johnson felt very strongly about states rights so he began the term of presidential reconstruction which can also be known as White Southern Reconstruction. So this was 1865 to 1866. So Johnson felt like there should be accountability, but when all was said and done, the states really ought to be able to determine for themselves how they regrouped from this war experience that they'd had. So Johnson gave Southern states free reign to rebuild themselves okay let's see so in so doing johnson created helped create this giant giant feud between himself and the congress and it was specifically between the radical republicans okay um he would veto bills and they would unveto them <laughs> that's not what it's called but he they would override them or he would veto bills and they wouldn't be overridden there was um lots of troubles and um, one of the things happened in early 1866 was the Congress went to um, re-up the um, funding for the Freedmen's Bureau and they attached a civil rights bill onto it and Johnson vetoed that um, which caused a permanent rupture in his relationship with Congress and that was the first step to his impeachment um, in 1866, he did this terrible thing. He went on a speaking tour around the country. So he jumped on a train and he drove around and he called it my plan tour. And um, he went around to different cities and he brought Ulysses S. Grant with him and somebody else. And Grant was just humiliated uh, because he couldn't keep his cool and eventually just started spouting terrible things and yelling and screaming and it looked terrible for him. So his tour failed and on February 24th, 
1868. So um, <laughs> there are some there are some uh, similarities being made in some of the articles I read that compare him to today. But we're looking at history, people, history, right? Um, he was impeached. His tour failed, and the re radical. Republic. Oh, sorry. His tour failed. What he was trying to do was garner some support so that he could get more people or um, congressmen voted in that would be on his side so that he could stop all the vetoes. And it didn't work because his tour was so atrocious that there was a landslide in the next election for the radical Republicans. And so he lost all of his veto power whatsoever um, after that. So, um, and then the radical Republicans impeached him. And he was elected, no, the radical Republicans were elected in November. Um, they impeached Johnson in February and they tried him in March. And he was one, they were one vote short of removing him from office. So, we always like that, that idea of that one vote makes a difference, right? So with the ushering in of the um, radical Republicans to Congress, it became a reconstruction became a um, congressional thing. And they passed what were called the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. There were four of them and they became the basis for radical Republican reconstruction. Okay, let me see what I got here. Oh, okay, I'm going to turn the page here. So um, we're going to go back again a little bit to Johnson's reconstruction. I told you that he loves states' rights, and this terrible thing happened. So um, there were, in the fall of 1865, there were several constitutional conventions in the South. So they knew that they were supposed to write new constitutions. So on the right here, this is President Johnson's amnesty proclamation which he issued in may so it was a month after a little month after um um well oh debbie thank you for that question and i was going to say you guys if there's anything that i don't know i will get back to you so she wants to know what he was impeached for i think he was impeached mostly um i know i have it written down here but just for abuse of power i think he was so over the top in what he was doing but his proclamation said that he, their amnesty would be granted to everyone who had taken part in the rebellion, um, but they wouldn't have their slaves restored. Um, it says, and except in cases where legal proceedings have been in instituted for the confiscation of property, they were going to get their property back. And they just had to say that they were going to obey the laws. So... They had to take a, a oath of loyalty and say that they had repealed secession in their new constitutional conventions or in their new constitutions. Um, they had to pay off their war debts. They had to ratify the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery um, and make, you know, say that they did that. And that was it. So the problem was that these new constitutions that were being written um, were only being written and voted on by the rich whites of the South. They were the only ones that could, could vote. And we can say those are AKA the plantation owners. So you guys can see the problems, right? So um, one of the things they did, which is kind of interesting, is they instituted free public education for the first time, but it was for whites only. But um, by so they're thinking they're very they're very full of themselves thinking we have done a great job here, um, and the by December of the very year of his inauguration, every southern state except Florida and Texas had gone through the required process, and was once more so far as the president was concerned in normal relations with the federal government. So he's like, good job, guys, and they're like, I know, right? But um. One of the things that was happening, and um, let's see, I said I would go back to it, so let me see if I can real quick here. Um, on January 16th, 1865, William T. Sherman, um, he was a Union 
um, officer, he gave field order number 15. And field order number 15 said that there had been all of this land that was confiscated. He knew of specific land and um, he wanted to give it to the slaves. And what he did was he went and he spoke to a whole bunch of um, leaders in the African American community, he talked to a whole bunch of, um, of uh, religious leaders. And he said, what do you guys want? What would be the thing that would help you the most? And Benita, you'll appreciate this. They said, please give us land. We would like land to live on. If we don't have land, we don't, we, we can't, you know, we don't have anything. We need to have something that's ours. And so, um, Sherman gave this field order no, number 15, which would give this big swath of land in South Carolina and Georgia to, um, freed slaves. And it, it spawned the term, if you've ever heard it, there's a term that um, they were owed 40 acres and a mule. And so, fast forward here to this time of Johnson's Reconstruction. Near the end of it, um, the end of that first year, there started to be um, some rumors spread that the, that, so that, that program didn't even work. John, or, um, Sherman's field order was revoked. He did give the land to them, but then it was um, taken back. But at the end of the year there, um, there started to be a rumor that they were going to be given their 40 acres and a mule on Christmas Day. Um, so what happened was that the, work, the, the blacks that were working they were doing the, they were being forced to sign labor contracts in the South. And we'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. But they had heard that they were going to get this 40 acres and a mule. So they refused to sign their um, contracts with white landowners for the new year. And so then the Southern whites, who, by the way, if you've ever studied them, these guys are the biggest babies. Like, they have always lived in fear that the um, slaves were going to form an insurrection and kill them all. And <clears throat> that had been a fear um, a lot, a long time if you've ever studied John Brown and Harper's, what happened at Harper's Ferry. The, the fear that they lived under was, was, was palpable. So they were like, oh, they were freaking out. So um, what they did was produce what were known as the Black Codes. So. Oh, I told her I got ahead of myself there. Um, I'm going to keep going here. So, the Black Codes were laws that the southern states passed to um, help to manage these um, African Americans um, that were freed. So, their purpose was to restrict their labor, at, their labor and their activity. So, um, they didn't, they passed laws against vagrancy um, owning property, the, there were contract laws, there were, um, labor contract laws, there was a thing called an anti-enticement measure, which meant that you couldn't pay anyone, you couldn't offer to pay someone more if they had a contract elsewhere, you couldn't say, I'll pay you more, come over here, that was against the law, under the black codes. Um, the first ones were passed in Mississippi and South Carolina, and they were, um, South Carolina's law, one of them said that there would be a tax of 10 to to $100 on any occupation other than farmer or servant. So if you were an artisan of any sort, um, if you were an already free black who had a job other than a farmer or a servant, you were being asked to pay these taxes, and it was very hard. So um, you can see the things I highlighted on here. They had to sign contracts. They were not allowed to be vagrant. Um, if you you had a penalty if you if you weren't happy with the wages, um, there was compulsory apprenticeship for Negroes who were underage. So like teenage, I don't even know. They probably started much younger than that. That they would be forced into basically indentured servitude. Um, they had to get licenses for um, before they could work and if they were any type of vagrant then they would be 
um, in involuntary could be put into involuntary servitude. Okay, so um, this is pretty egregious, right? So this is happening under Johnson's reconstruction, a lot of it because of so much fear, but also just because they're jerks. But no, you can't say that, right? We're studying through the eyes of the people. They were um, very upset about losing their way of life. They were trying to keep it as much as with you know, hang on to it with every thing that they had. So, um, because of the things that Andrew Johnson did, and I'll I'll find the exact impeachment um, wording. So I'll tell you that next week. But he was impeached, and um, he just lost all his power. And so this ushered in the ability for the um, radical Republicans to. Um, to form to um, shape Reconstruction, and they did that through the Reconstruction Acts. So there was four of them. One of the things they did, which I wasn't aware of, is that they went down and they divided. They, so they just started over again, um, and they nullified all of the state constitutions that had been written. So they had to do them again, and they went and they divided the South into five military districts. So you can see that they're labeled here in color. Um, and they were each each of those districts was um, presided over by a general in the military, and this is kind of the um, type of behavior I'm more familiar with that happens at the end of of um, a conflict under war. If you lose, then you're you have to be subject to whoever you lost to. But um, each state had to write a new state constitution that specifically outlawed slavery. And then by this time, they had to also not only ratify the 13th Amendment, but they had to ratify the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment um, gave citizenship to... <laughs> Who do you guys think were granted citizenship by the 14th Amendment at this time? Any thoughts? Or who do you think weren't given um, citizenship? That's the question. <laughs> um, so the 14th Amendment gave citizenship, not the right to vote. We'll get to there in a minute. But um, one of the interesting things that happened was that it did not give Native Americans the right to vote. Thank you, Jenny. You have it right. Um, they said that if you were if you were taxed, you could get um, citizenship. And so it created, I looked it up, and there's some real inf interesting um, information about that. But it wasn't until 1948 that Native Americans on a whole were um, allowed, or were given full citizenship. There were several different ways that they could do it before, but as a blanket thing, it wasn't until much later. Um, all right, and then each state had to grant voting rights to black men. So... We said that that did not happen for women or, um, yeah, women until much later as well, not till 1920. Okay, so these are the players in the, in the amongst the radical Republicans. You have Thaddeus Stevens, who was the leader of the radical Republicans. You can tell he's a, a happy, happy man. Um, and he was the representative from Pennsylvania. He was very tireless in the work that he did. And then we have Charles Sumner, who is the senator, for, was the senator from Massachusetts, who's also um, a member of the Radical Republicans. And I looked it up, and Sumner, Washington is named after Charles Sumner. And um, so you might see that in your own cities. Um, I think it's always fun, interesting to find out where, where the names come from and who were we honoring. So, um, these are some of the other players of Reconstruction, and these are some political cartoons that explain who these people were. So, um, one was the carpetbaggers, and if I was familiar with carpetbagger as a term for um, a, someone who's trying to get into office in like a state that they didn't live in, they moved there just so they could get elected. We call that carpet bagging, but in this sense, 
in this instance, a carpetbagger was a person from the northern states who went to the south after the Civil War to profit from Reconstruction. So you can see he's got his bag um, on the back. He says he's going from Wisconsin to Missouri. Um, and this was very upsetting to white Southerners. And then the other thing that upset Southerners were these guys called Scalawags. And a Scalawag was a white Southerner who collaborated with Northern Republicans during Reconstruction. So if you, you know, might have heard of the, the, the term being an Uncle Tom, so an African American who might not support, um, who might give in to white pressure till that he could better his life. And so the, the same term um, was meant for the, a scalawag. It was used derisively by white Southern Democrats who did not appreciate reconstruction legislation. All right. And then we have these other two interesting um, players here on the left is these are political cartoons. On the left is Ulysses S. Grant, who's being carried in a carpet bag um, and being protected by all of these bayonets and stuff. And in the back, you can see the destructed, uh, the um, destroyed South, and he's being carried on the back of the solid South, who they always um, portrayed as a woman. And then on the right, we have Rutherford B. Hayes. And there's a reason why you don't ever hear much about old Rutherford. But the caption of his is, the, the, the juxtaposition is um, Grant was the strong government and Rutherford was the weak government. And he issued a let him alone policy. So I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So another interested player in Reconstruction was this organization called the Ku Klux Klan. So the Ku Klux Klan was actually founded on December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. So um, they were founded by ex-Confederate soldiers who were upset about what was happening in their states. And they did all the things that we think they did. Um, but they were much more brazen and bold about it. There was no reason to be... Um, quiet about their upsetness and so um, they did intimidation um, it, so if you were a Freedmen's Bureau worker you would have definitely most likely experienced intimidation from the Klan um, and um, so they were active for about six years and in 1871 the Ku Klux Act passed Congress um, and it was by President Grant, and he authorized military force to suppress them. And um, and and what happened was um, there were counties in in South Carolina. So notice the names that we're talking about here. So some of the more egregious, outspoken, um, angry states were places like Missouri and South Mississippi and South Carolina. Um, in South Carolina, nine counties were placed under martial law and thousands were arrested as for being part of the Ku Klux Klan. And they were actually disbanded in 1882 by the, um, by the United States Supreme Court. They declared, oh, I said that wrong. Um, you know what? I looked that up late, so let me get back to it because it says that the Supreme Court declared the Ku Klux Act unconstitutional. But... Um, by that time, anyway, they were kind of a moot point because they had started to fade away. Um, we know that it didn't go away. They kind of went underground. And if you, I, I liken it to the, um, the, met, the metaphor of a forest fire. So fires will go out, but the, the fire remains in the roots of the trees and then it travels along until it can come back up and start up again. So, um, I didn't know if I was going to get through this today, but it looks like I just might. So then next week we can talk about um, turn of the century and Jim Crow laws and see um, what happened when the Klan came back. So um, during the time of radical reconstruction with the radical Republicans, um, it was this renaissance in um, some African Americans lives. There was the black voter who could do just that, get out and vote. 
and you had um, you had black, blacks who were elected to federal office. Joseph Rainey was the representative um, from South Carolina. Let's see if I wrote this down here. Um, hold on one moment. Yeah, he was the first representative and the second senator. So he did two terms. And um, Hiram Revels was a senator from Mississippi who only served one year. So then, um, then you have this guy, Blanche Kelso Bruce, who was a f the first full-term senator, and he served from 1875 to 1881, which is kind of a little unheard of. It's well past the end of Reconstruction, so he'd be an interesting person to know more about, served from the state of Mississippi. Um, all right, so stop. Um, the second of the Reconstruction Amendments came in 1868 and extended citizenship to African American men and women. Oh, excuse me, the 14th Amendment was ratified, which extended citizenship, 1868. And then um, thereafter, uh, Ulysses S. Grant was elected as 18th president, and he, Ulysses S. Grant is a very um, probably misunderstood um, president. He he um, right not long after his presidency, he actually died of a terrible um, cancer. I think it was cancer in his tongue, and um, he had been a general in the in the union and he was married to this woman and her family and they were not friendly to the african-american cause and grant was so grant would not have considered himself necessarily racist but he had this wife who was and they they are known to have this really great um love affair they just loved each other so much and but he um would tell her that she needed to stop and so grant was elected president and it, they said it, he was a little bit bewildered so it was a difficult time because reconstruction was um, starting to get more difficult and so you'll see we'll pass over the um, 15th amendment for a moment but in 1870 and 1871 there were these things called the enforcement acts and it's where federal troops were called in to protect the civil voting rights of African Americans and that was done by Grant so he was known, and I showed you the strong government the cartoon, so he was known as um, being strong to get re Reconstruction, um, you know, to enforce what had happened, but he um, spent his whole presidency doing that. One of the things that happened under his presidency was the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which prohibited disenfranchisement by race, color, or previous servitude. So this is a super important amendment to the Constitution because it said that they needed to let all, all males vote. However, what they didn't do was make sure that they didn't um, find any loopholes. So one of the biggest loopholes that happened at this time that the South took advantage of was voter qualifications. And so as a result of the passing of the 15th Amendment, while everyone was allowed to vote, the qualifications became more stringent. So there were things like a poll, a poll tax you had to pay to be able to vote at the polls or a literacy test. You had to be able to read and they didn't even give you like easy passages to read. You'd have to read like the Declaration of Independence or some, you know, it didn't matter because a lot of them couldn't read anyway. Um, there was a thing called the Grandfather Clause, so you could vote if your grandfather could vote. And these were just mean things, like they were just clearly meant to um, stop African Americans from voting. Um, but what happened was this 15th Amendment being in place was what allowed um, the civil rights movement of the 1960s to have the teeth that it had and the uh, uh, opportunity it had to then um, force the hand of the government in passing civil rights legislation that stopped those um, voter qualifications. But 
it didn't happen for a hundred years, which is um, very regrettable. So um, we're going to come to the end of reconstruction here. Um, and the reason why I wanted to start here, what I think um, is super important for us to understand, and I think probably the majority of you do, but the failure of reconstruction meant that African Americans were once again consigned to poverty and institutionalized slavery in America. They did not get their their um, their right to vote, and they didn't get to keep the freedoms that they had fought that were fought so hard for. And as a result of that, it took a hundred years before um, we would once again stand up and do what needed to be done so that everyone could vote. And what happened, and it's the terriblest thing I've ever heard, this guy, Rutherford B. Hayes, was elected and he lost the popular vote. We know about this, right? He lost the popular vote to the Democrat. But those Democrats were not dumb. They knew they needed to have, they needed an ace in the hole. So they told Rutherford, now he was a Republican, he was a radical Republican. But he, they said, you can have 20 electoral college votes that will put you into the presidency. <laughs> and it was called the Compromise of 1877. All you have to do is pull the troops out of the South and end Reconstruction. And Rutherford said, okay. And so um, as a result, um, Reconstruction was over. It was dead. The, the people in the North had wasn't interesting as much anymore. They'd lost, um, you know, they weren't paying attention anymore. And and Rutherford became president, and um, the time that that window of opportunity was gone. And so, um, what took its place? What took the place of slavery in America was this system called sharecropping. And I'll talk to you guys about that next week. But sharecropping was a system of usury, which is um, um, intense amounts of debt, crushing debt that the sharecropping sharecropping farmer could never get out of. So um, the the plantation owners would kindly allow them to farm parts of their land, and they had to buy everything from them to do so. And they had an, an incredible amounts of of um, tax, you know, money to pay, interest to pay on it. And when it came time to pay, they never could. So they were always, they just were getting more and more in debt. And um, they could barely even make enough to feed themselves. And so when you think of the poor black farmer um, in the South, in the South, um, the same system was in place for poor whites as well. Um, sharecropping was not um, only for African Americans, but... Um, when you look at the South and the difficulties they had then, those difficulties did not leave them. Um, my husband, uh, I got married two years ago, and um, I think he had been in Washington for maybe three, so five total. So five years ago, he was living in West Virginia, um, and he had a um, minimum wage job that, in the state of West Virginia in 2000, in 2015, we'll say, paid him $6 an hour. So I find that to be mind-blowing. But when you think that um, the South walked away without any repercussions, know that they didn't. And they're still experiencing them today all around. Um, so, um, in this, uh, PowerPoint here, I put some of the websites that I looked at and some of the books that I looked up. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so I can send this to, or I, I'll post it on, I don't know, 
I will put it somewhere. If you want it, here, let me put my email in the chat box. And if you want it, I'll just email it to you. So let me know. Okay. So what, what do you guys... So I, I, I shouldn't leave um, my presentation saying that um, the South had all these struggles. Um, I do want to leave you with the understanding that um, I, if we do know where we came from, we can better understand why we are where we are today. And I think that that is super important. I think it helps us to assign blame if necessary where blame belongs. It helps us to understand how not to do things again, how to um, break those cycles. Um, it also helps us to understand some of the ingrained feelings that people have and why they're there. So if you were raised one way, you continue to be raised that way. And um, if you're raised another way, you continue to be raised that way. So there's some really solid ingrained feelings um, in people and we need to um, acknowledge that. I was, I told you at the beginning that my um, grandparents were African American and raised my dad and their work ethic on him was powerful because that's how they were raised um, and there wasn't a lot of um, babying you didn't get coddled you didn't do you know you, you did what you needed to do and you uh, you took care of yourself and um, self-sufficiency was super important um, so there's lots and lots of things I challenge you to cut to try and um, see those see those things that are legacies good and bad of where we've come from um, so I'll stop talking because I feel like I am now babbling it is 804 and I'd love to hear any of your thoughts about what was shared today so you can turn on you can turn on your microphone or you can type in the chat box did anyone find something that they want to study this week Uh, I just want to say that I didn't learn like hardly any of this in school. So this is like really interesting um, in light of what we're all dealing with right now and like why we're all here. Um, so I just think um, I just I'm really grateful to you for, you know, doing this for us. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that I need to think about and um, lots of places I can go with this. Thank you. Thanks for helping me to be inspired, right? Mm -hmm. so Amy wants to study the black codes. Um, Debbie wants to learn more about voter suppression. And Christy agrees with you. All right, guys, I'm going to um, turn off the recording. Thanks to everyone. And um, 